In this video, we'll work out parity check matrices for Reed Solomon codes. Before we start, we need a few more algebra definitions. Our first definition is of FQ star. FQ star is what we'll define to be the multiplicative group of non-zero elements in FQ. That is, it's just the set of all the non-zero elements in FQ. In this context, multiplicative group means that it's a group under multiplication. That just means that it's closed under multiplication and undertaking multiplicative inverses. Here's an example. Consider the field F5, which as we've seen is equal to the number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, with addition and multiplication mod 5. Then F5 star is just all the non-zero elements of F5, so that's 1, 2, 3, 4, with multiplication mod 5. Notice that I no longer want to define addition on this set because, for example, 2 plus 3 is 0, which is not in the set. So let's just stick to multiplication. Here's a fact about FQ star. It forms a cyclic group. What that means is that there is some element gamma in FQ star, so that FQ star is generated by gamma. That means that FQ star is equal to the set gamma, gamma squared, gamma cubed, dot dot dot, up to gamma to the q minus 1. Such a gamma is called a primitive element of FQ. Sorry, this star shouldn't be there. Returning to our example, 2 is a primitive element of F5, because if we take 2 and start powering it up, we get 2, and then 2 squared is equal to 4, 2 cubed is equal to 8, which is 3 mod 5, 2 to the 4th is equal to 16, which is 1 mod 5, and this set is equal to F5 star. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4. On the other hand, 4 is not primitive, because if we take 4 and start powering it up, we get 4 squared equals 1, 4 cubed is back to 4 mod 5, 4 to the 4th is equal to 1 mod 5, and so on. So we're only ever going to get 1, 4, 1, 4, 1, 4, 1, 4. We'll never get 3 or 2. Here's a useful fact about finite fields. For any d greater than 0 and less than q minus 1, the sum over all alpha in a finite field fq of alpha to the d is equal to 0. Here's a proof of this fact. So the sum over all alpha in fq of alpha to the d, this is also the sum over all alpha in fq star of alpha to the d, because we're just leaving out 0, and that would only contribute 0 to the sum. And this is the sum from j equals 0 to q minus 2 of gamma to the j to the d, where gamma is a primitive element. That's because as we iterate over all of these powers of gamma, we're going to iterate over all of the elements of fq star, by definition. Just a note that here I'm having the powers of gamma go from 0 to q minus 2 instead of from 1 to q minus 1 like I did on the previous slide. Uh, it turns out these are the same. Do you see why? If not, we'll see why in just a minute. Okay, so now I can switch the order of these two exponents. This is equal to the sum from j equals 0 to q minus 2 of gamma to the d to the j. And this is equal to 1 minus gamma to the d to the q minus 1 divided by 1 minus gamma to the d. Why is this true? Well, you might remember a formula like this that works over the real numbers or something like that. It works just fine over finite fields, too. For concreteness, let's prove this real quick. So for all x not equal to 1, 1 minus x times the sum from j equals 0 to, let's say, t minus 1 for some t of x to the j is equal to 1 minus x to the t. You can see that just by multiplying it out. You basically get this telescoping sum where everything cancels except the first one and the last term. 
And so dividing both sides by 1 minus x, which we can do since x is not equal to 1, we see that this sum is equal to 1 minus x to the t divided by 1 minus x. So now we're just going to apply this with x gets gamma to the d, and we get that. But now I claim that this thing is equal to 1. That is, gamma to the d to the q minus 1 is equal to 1. And this is because gamma to the d to the q minus 1 times gamma to the d is equal to gamma to the d to the q. And if you recall, we saw a fact in a previous video that said that this is just equal to gamma to the d. Anything in fq, when you raise it to the q, is just equal to itself. So dividing both sides by gamma to the d, this implies that gamma to the d to the q minus 1 is equal to 1. Just to note, this explains earlier why it was okay to shift the indices from 1 to q minus 1 to 0 to q minus 2. Gamma to the 0 is equal to gamma to the q minus 1. They're both equal to 1. Okay, but now we can use this logic here to see that this is equal to 1 minus 1 divided by 1 minus gamma to the d, and that's equal to 0. Here, we're using the fact that gamma to the d is not equal to 1. And that follows since d is not equal to 0 or q minus 1. And as we just saw, gamma to the 0 or gamma to the q minus 1 are equal to 1. But for any d in between, we have to get all of the other elements, because gamma is a primitive element, so we're not going to get 1 that way. So this is 0 divided by something non-zero, and that's 0. So that proves this fact. Using that fact, we can now prove this proposition about Reed-Solomon codes, which gives us another way of looking at them. So the proposition says, let n be equal to q minus 1, and let gamma be a primitive element of fq. Then consider the Reed-Solomon code with evaluation points gamma to the 0, gamma to the 1, dot 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 gamma to the n minus 1, with block length n and dimension k. The proposition says that this is equal to the set of all vectors c0, c1, dot 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 up to cn minus 1, so that c of gamma to the j is equal to 0 for all j between 1 and n minus k. And here c is the polynomial c of x, which is given by the sum from j equals 0 to n minus 1, of c sub j x to the j. Notice that this is kind of flipping things around. In our original definition of Reed-Solomon codes, our message was the coefficients of some polynomial, and our code word was the evaluations of that polynomial. In this view, the code word is the coefficients of some polynomial, and we have these constraints that that polynomial is equal to zero when evaluated on certain points. Let's prove this proposition. So let's let f be some polynomial of degree k minus 1, or degree at most k minus 1. So that means that a Reed-Solomon code word looks like evaluations of f. Now consider the corresponding polynomial c from this proposition, and let's see what happens when we evaluate it on gamma to the j. We get c of gamma to the j is equal to the sum from l equals 0 to n minus 1 of c sub l gamma to the j times l. And remember that c l here is equal to f of gamma to the l. So writing out what that means, this is equal to the sum over l of f of gamma to the l, which is the sum from i equals 0 to k minus 1 of f sub i times gamma to the l times i, all times gamma to the j times l, because that was sitting right there. Now switching the order of summations, this is equal to the sum from i equals 0 to k minus 1 of f sub i times the sum from l equals 0 to n minus 1 of gamma to the i plus j times l. Notice that 0 is less than or equal to i is less than or equal to k minus 1 by definition, and 1 is less than or equal to j is less than or equal to n minus k by definition. 
So that means that i plus j is at least 1, and at most n minus 1. So coming back over here, let's rewrite this term a little bit. So instead of gamma to the i plus j times l, I'm going to write it as gamma to the l to the i plus j. And as we saw over here, i plus j is at least 1, and at most n minus 1, which in particular is strictly less than q minus 1, since n is q minus 1 itself, which means that this thing here is equal to 0 by the useful fact that we saw on the previous slide. That means that this whole thing is 0. OK, so this shows one direction of this proposition. In particular, it shows containment in this direction, that the re this Reed-Solomon code here is a subset of this set here. I claim that containment is also true in the other direction, and to see that, you can count the dimensions of these two sets. That is, this set has dimension k, it's a Reed-Solomon code of dimension k, and I claim that this set also has dimension k. And that means that this containment is enough to show this equality. To see that this set has dimension k, let's table that for just one slide, because it'll be easier to see once we write down the parity check matrix view of this statement. So here's the parity check matrix view of the statement that we just saw, which I've written here as a corollary. It says that this matrix is a parity check matrix for the Reed-Solomon code that we were looking at in the previous proposition. So this is the matrix where the first row is 1, gamma, gamma squared, dot, 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 all the way up to gamma to the n minus 1. The second row is 1, gamma squared, gamma to the fourth, dot, 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 up to gamma to the 2, n minus 1, and so on. So there are n columns here and n minus k rows. To see why this proposition says that h here is a parity check matrix for that Reed-Solomon code, let's consider what happens when we multiply h by a vector. And let's suppose that the elements of this vector are c0, c1, dot dot dot, down to c n minus 1. What we get is another vector. And the jth entry of this vector is the sum from i equals 0 to n minus 1 of ci times gamma to the ji. That's just how uh, matrix vector multiplication works. But this is equal to c of gamma to the j, where c is the polynomial as we defined it in the corollary. Thus, that implies that the set of vectors c0 up to cn minus 1, such that c of gamma to the j is equal to 0 for all j between 1 and n minus k, is in fact equal to the kernel of h because this statement is exactly the same as the statement that h times this vector is equal to 0. Thus, the proposition says that Reed-Solomon codes are actually this set, so therefore they are also actually the kernel of h. So h is a parity check matrix for the corresponding Reed-Solomon code. Notice that this view also shows why this set has dimension k, which I claimed on the previous slide. In particular, this parity check matrix h here is a Vanderbond matrix. Therefore, it has full rank, rank n minus k. But then the dimension of the kernel of h is going to be n minus its rank, which is equal to k. Cool. So now we know the parity check matrix of a Reed-Solomon code, or at least this particular Reed-Solomon code, the one whose evaluation points are gamma to the 0, gamma to the 1, dot, 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 up to gamma to the n minus 1 for a primitive element gamma. While we're on the topic of parity check matrices, notice that this parity check matrix H is, as we just noted, a Vandermond matrix. In particular, its transpose looks an awful lot like the generator matrix for a Reed-Solomon code. It's not quite the same because the column of ones is going to be at the top of the transpose instead of along the side, but it's pretty close. This kind of suggests that the dual of a Reed-Solomon code is basically a Reed-Solomon code. It turns out that's true. To make that a bit more precise, we can define something called a generalized Reed-Solomon code. So a generalized Reed-Solomon code, which I'm going to denote GRS sub Q, 
with parameters alpha, those are the evaluation points, n, the block length, k, the dimension, and a vector lambda, where lambda is a vector in f q star to the n, is the following set. So it's exactly the same as a Reed-Solomon code, except I'm going to stick these multiples of the lambda i's in front of each coordinate. So the zeroth coordinate is always going to be multiplied by lambda zero, the first coordinate is always going to be multiplied by lambda one, and so on. It turns out that with just this small change, the observation that we made before about the transpose of the parity check matrix looking more or less like a generator matrix for Reed-Solomon code is actually true. That is, when you look at the parity check matrix of a generalized Reed-Solomon code and you take the transpose of that, you're going to get the generator matrix of another generalized Reed-Solomon code. In other words, we have the following theorem. Oh, whoops, there's a little typo in my theorem. Give me just a sec. Okay, now we have the following theorem. For any sequence of evaluation points, alpha, distinct evaluation points, and any vector lambda in fq star to the n, there is some vector sigma in fq star to the n, so the following holds. If you look at the generalized Reed-Solomon code with evaluation points alpha and these multiples lambda, and you look at the dual of that, that thing is again going to be a generalized Reed-Solomon code with the same evaluation points, but with multiples given by sigma. And the dimension, if it started out as k, is going to be n minus k in the dual. I'm not going to do this proof here, but I encourage you to give it a try. In particular, can you figure out what exactly these multiples sigma should be in terms of lambda? Okay, so that's it for this video. So now we know both the generator matrices and parity check matrices for Reed-Solomon codes, and we know that Reed-Solomon codes meet the singleton bound. And all of this was just due to one extremely useful fact. All right, polynomials don't have too many roots. Thanks, Polly.